Uh, our next speaker is. Uh, you need the clicker. Okay. Here's the clicker. Uh, Dr. Uh, Desmond Avlami, who uh, is a senior researcher uh, in the Research Center for Medieval and Modern Greek Studies at the Academy of Athens. Uh, her paper is entitled uh, Trading with the Ottomans, the Levant Company in the Middle East. Uh, can you hear me? No. All right. No? No. <laughs> All right. So let's go back to the 16th century now. <laughs> um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like first to. Still can hear you. Yes. All right. I would like first to congratulate you for uh, to congratulate the Levantine Heritage Foundation. Uh, for organizing such an interesting and inspiring uh, conference. I'm glad to be here among you today. Um, and I look forward uh, to listening to the lectures of my colleagues in the coming days. The Levant Company is one of the <coughs> earliest examples in the history of corporate. Excuse me? Why don't you use the big microphone here today? You can take my microphone. Okay. Yes, much better. You can sing as well. No? <laughs> Better? Yeah. All right. Uh, the Levant Company is one of the earliest examples in the history of corporations of a powerful trading company conducting business on a, glo on a global scale. And as such, it, its history proves the remarkable contribution of business and social networks in the organization, strategy, and performance of an international <laughs> enterprise. The nucleus of the Levant Company dates to 1581, when one year after the signing of the capitulation agreements between England and the Ottoman Empire, Queen Elizabeth I granted a group of 12 London wholesale merchants the exclusive right to trade in the Levant for seven years. In the following decades, the company's privileges were extended and its corporate form and organization changed many times before being finalized in 1661. My presentation will focus on the final 30 years of the company's history. The period starts with the outbreak of war against France in 1792 and closes with the abdication of the company's authority to the British state in 1825. This was a period of crisis and change as a series of wars and conflicts created conditions of permanent insecurity in transport and trade. War disrupted trade in the Mediterranean region through blockades, <coughs> ship sequestrations, piracy, and contraband activities. Successive crises put merchants under strain and required flexible strategies and innovative spirit. After 1815, the structure and techniques of commercial enterprise had changed immensely. From the 18th century, the Levant Company went through a period of transition during which it had to modernize its organization and diversify its strategy in order to retain control of British trade and become more efficient. War and antagonism had exposed its deficiencies, uh, while its authority went undermined by the constant intervention of the British <coughs> government and the liberal criticism the company received from the merchant community back to Britain. Throughout its history, the company functioned at three distinctive uh, but interconnected levels. First, as a powerful state institution, responsible for the diplomatic representation of England in the Ottoman Empire, and the implementation of the capitulation agreements, then as an international trading enterprise, and finally, as a system of interacting merchants and entrepreneurs engaged in a variety of contractual and individual intra and extra company uh, relations. Today, I will refer briefly to the company's institutional and structural attributes and their development over time, and then I will review its operation as an international trading enterprise during a period of crisis that led to its, to its uh, dissolution. The charters were the footing upon which lay the company's close connection with the Crown and the state. The 1661 charter permanently settled all the issues concerning the company's jurisdiction, organization, and membership, and remained in force until 1825. The company was an association of merchants and was, entra and was entrusted with the representation of the state to the Ottoman authorities. Its officers in the Levant operated both as company representatives, advancing the business interests of its members, freemen, and as diplomats, performing a variety of political, economic, and bureaucratic duties. While in its early days the company was organized as a joint stock corporation, the 1661 charter endorsed the company's organization as a regulated corporation, 
which meant that each of its members trading, uh, traded individually as long as he complied with the company's rules. Here is a well-known portrait of Francis Levitt Jr. Uh, in his merchant in Constantinople between 1737 and 1750. The company's members operated with their own resources and they could choose their own organization and strategy and develop their own business network. However, they were obliged under oath to operate the direct trade between Britain and the Levant and advance to the company consular duties that were calculated upon the value of the goods they transacted. The business of freemen comprised mainly the import and export of goods from Britain to the Levant and back. They exported cloth, lead, hides, herrings, and tea, and imported raw silk, cotton, mohair, and woolen yarn, carpets, drugs, and pigments, spices, and carrots. To become a member, an individual had to be a mere merchant and not a retailer. He had to pay a membership, a membership fee and be a London citizen. An exception was made. Um, um, for the noblemen, an exception was made for noblemen and gentlemen who could uh, be admitted without being London citizens. Sons and apprentices of members were allowed also to join the company on favorable conditions. Um, the company had a centralized management organized in hierarchy. At the top of the hierarchy, there was a governor, a deputy governor, <coughs> and eight assistants. Uh, the administration was elected by the annual General Assembly of the company's members held in London. The General Assembly and the administration formed the company's general court, which met regularly and had extensive executive, legislative, and judicial authority. Now the factories. Um, sorry? No. The headquarters of the company, as I said, were in London. Offices of, or factories were founded at strategic trading outposts in the Ottoman Empire, in Constantinople, Aleppo, Tripolis, in Syria, Alexandria, and Cairo, later on in Smyrna, Larnaca, Salonika. Since the 16th century, another important operational axis developed in the area of the Ionian Sea, the center of the current trade, comprising trading outposts of the western coast of Greece, the Peloponnese, and the major Ionian islands. <laughs> An ambassador was appointed in Constantinople by the English crown, but his salary and expenses were covered, were paid by the company. Each factory was under the supervision of a consul, while the chancellor and the treasurer were appointed among the, members, among the members of the factory. The company's activity was regulated by its bylaws, a set of rules applying to many aspects of the company's organization and doings. Finally, the company's international reach was served by an extended communication mechanism through which systematic institutional and private correspondence diffused information vertically and horizontally. Here there is a view of uh, Constantinople, Aleppo, mm. this main map from the board. From the 18th century, the liberal criticism the Levant, Comp the Levant Company received resulted in significant changes in organization and strategy. In 1744, the system of general ships uh, chartered annually by the company on behalf of its members was abandoned after severe criticism and reactions from the government and the merchant community. In 1753, the company lifted the barriers of membership, allowing merchants who were retailers, non-London citizens, and Jews to join as long as they could pay an entrance fee of 20 pounds. Following that, the overall number of members grew. British nationality became the most important criterion for being accepted as a member. In 1791, the adoption of barter as the prevalent system of transactions in the Levant was abandoned. The system impeded free transactions, and it was eventually sidestepped by the members. From the beginning of the French wars, the company adopted also a more tolerant approach towards partnerships with foreigners in order to defend its members' revenues from the effects of war and blockades. In 1797, the Navigation Acts, which restricted the, the transport of goods to and from Britain and its colonies to British ships, were temporarily suspended, and the new act allowed British goods to be carried on on, uh, on Ottoman vessels. The company introduced new regulations in its bylaws and even modified the oath given by members when making entries of goods. In 1804, the appointment of a general consul in Constantinople, directly dependent by the company <laughs> to oversee its commercial affairs, determined hierarchy and distribution of power among the company officials in the Levant. 
During the same period, family lobbying had a powerful influence in the company's organization and hierarchy, while incidents of evasion of the company's rules and misinterpretation of the bylaws were frequent, evidence of a widening gap between central administration and local management. From the late 18th century, a series of wars and conflicts created conditions of permanent security in transport and commercial trade. The long Franco-British conflict throughout the French and the Napoleonic Wars, encounters of the Ottoman Empire with Russia and Persia, the brief wars between Britain and Russia, the Ottoman Empire and the United States, and finally the Greek War of Independence. During this period, British trade in the Ottoman Empire went through a phase of great instability, with periods of high revenue, alternating with periods of low turns over and inactivity. This instability is evident in the balance of British trade with the Ottoman Empire from 1793 to 1825, that compiled from the data from different secondary and primary sources portrays the fluctuations of business transactions. In 1812, British exports to the Ottoman Empire totaled 300, uh, 311 thousand pounds almost, the highest figure since the 17th century, and further expanded after the Napoleonic Wars. <coughs> As the protracted period of war overturned trading and transport conditions in the Levant, the company had to address many new challenges. From the late 18th century, a new system of trade evolved around a new operational center, Malta, and extended to adjacent seas and continents, the Balkan routes leading to the Habsburg Empire, the Black Sea and the southern Russian ports in the Northeast, the Adriatic and the Ionian Seas, the Atlantic and the United States. The modification of the company's bylaws to allow Ottoman subjects to trade in Britain in privileged terms supported British trade but had many unexpected consequences for the company and its members. In the meantime, British freemen ventured into free partnerships with British and foreigners as a variety of newcomers, British, Maltese, Greeks, Jews and Armenian, Ottoman subjects, as well as German, American, Italian, and Russian, participated in an interwoven fabric of commercial transactions. As they advanced their business, they adopted tactics of individual traders in a coordinated and bold manner, contravening the company's regulations and prejudicing its interests. Here is uh, Malta. Um, Salonica. And the custom house in Constantinople. Um, I'm going on because I don't have uh, that much time. Um, the suspension of the British Navigation Act in 1797, which precipitated corresponding changes in the company's regulation, allowed the company to open uh, up to Ottoman subjects, mostly Greeks, Jews, and Armenians. This had some unexpected consequences for the company and its members, as many of them gradually permitted the structures of British trade, <coughs> establishing themselves as independent operators who would eventually compete with the company's freemen. The capitulation agreements of 58 and 6075 established and regulated <coughs> the connection between British and Ottoman trade within specific limits. It had taken precise forms with the organization of factories inside Ottoman societies where British merchants, in search of local footholds to promote their trade, set up business and established family and social relations with locals. Ottoman British trade had been enhanced by the transfer of British protection and trading license to Ottoman ship owners and merchants every time war disrupted transports and impeded transactions. It was reinforced with the purchase of barats by Ottoman merchants and brokers, who wished to avoid Ottoman taxes and establish partnerships with European merchants. Finally, Ottoman-British trading relationships were, were determined by the unpredictable behavior and the personal strategies of local officials, the priorities of the exigencies of Ottoman trade policies. It's a Greek merchant. Some company officials, like Sir Spencer Smith, Chazette Affair in the British Embassy at Constantinople in the late uh, 18th century, believed that the company's new policy could turn to the advantage of British trade. Some others, like Francis Weary, the powerful consul in Smyrna, were extremely skeptical towards any kind of reciprocal agreement between the company and Ottoman subjects, the Greeks in particular, foreseeing its permanent character and worrying that the Greeks would gradually interfere in British trade and hinder the company's monopoly. Weary was, was quickly proven right. 
Only a year later, in 1799, the company permitted Ottoman subjects to trade, this time in British vessels, paying only single duties like company members. <coughs> By the time the Levant Company decided to purposely support Ottoman trade, the entitlement of business interests and strategies of British and Ottoman subjects, Greeks, Jews, Armenians, had developed at an institutional and contractual level, forging relationships of collaboration and dependency that developed inside Ottoman markets. A number of cases depicted in the company's correspondence <laughs> revealed various types of associations that resulted in profit or loss and had considerable risk. Ottoman merchant houses acting as cover-up of British firms during war, Ottoman subjects acting as intermediaries of British merchants to local producers bypassing markets, Ottoman merchants employing British factors or being the silent partners in British enterprises, Greeks collaborating with British factory officials in contraband activities. A most important aspect of the connection between British and Ottoman subjects was the appointment of Ottoman subjects, mostly Greeks, as vice consuls in various ports and islands in the Aegean Sea. According to a catalog found in the company's archive, of the 29 vice consuls appointed between 1793 and 1810, 18 were Greeks, some others were Jews, and some other members of the Catholic communities of some of the Aegean islands. Here you can see also the names uh, of British officers in the Levant factories during the last 30 years of the company's uh, organization. A watershed in the development of the company's connection with, the, with Ottoman traders was the Anglo-Ottoman War in 1807. Two years later, the Treaty of Dardanelles provided for a full restoration of the capitulations. The fifth article of the treaty gave a considerable thrust to the establishment uh, of Ottoman-owned commercial houses in Britain. In 1818, the correspondence between the secretary of the company, George Liddell, and the company's chief customs officer in London, Jan de Reimer, confirmed these developments. De Reimer asked for instructions on how to deal with the numerous applications piled up on his office by Ottoman subjects, asking for permission to enter goods from the Levant for the account of themselves or other Ottomans established in the city. The general court of the company instructed the Reimer that until further notice, he was to permit such persons to make entries on payment of the company's single duties. As the volume and value of British trade in the Ottoman Empire augmented, the company's authority contracted. In 1815, the amount of consulate collected by Nathaniel Weary a vice consul in the Smyrna uh, factory, was reported to be the highest of the last 50 years. Despite this, we reported that the consulate derived from trade involving Ottomans and foreigners was double the amount paid by British subjects. The gradual opening of the company's trade to encompass Ottoman protégé and foreigners, offering them special status and privileges in order to assist British trade and navigation in crisis, multiplied the opportunities for profitable business ventures and collaborations outside the company's jurisdiction. While retaining their freedom, many members advanced their business adopting the tactics of individual traders, contravening the company's regulations. Of these strategic choices, the company reacted strongest against the involvement of its members in indirect trade, the engaging of foreign vessels, and the evasion of duty payment by various simulated techniques and fake operations. <coughs> The intermingling, the intermingling of methods and techniques of direct and indirect simulated and undercover trade operated by the company's members in collaboration with independent British merchants, Ottoman protégé and foreigners, attracted the attention of British merchants back to London, who were looking for commissioners and intermediaries into Levant markets. In, 18, in 1818, a Robert Thompson of London Street requested precise information from George Liddell, the company secretary, on the cost of these services. A year later, the company contemplated the idea of developing a different future for its members by permanently lifting all restrictions on partnership with foreigners. George Liddell was then authorized to ask the company solicitors, K. Freshfield and K., whether it was legal for the members to act as agents of Ottoman subjects or other foreigners' residents in Turkey and the United Kingdom. This plan did not move forward. In 1821, the outbreak of the Greek War of Independence kept British trade in check in the Levant for some years. 
In the 1820s, William Huskisson, as president of the Board of Trade, promoted a number of reductions in duties that were, that were welcomed by the company. However, Huskisson's main objective was to establish conditions of free trade and navigation and alleviate the burden of the company's dues on British trade in the Levant. In 1822, the company's authority over the Levant trade was further undermined. The indirect trade with the Levant received another boost under the terms uh, of a new reform navigation act. Its eighth clause allowed the importation of Ottoman product, products from the Ottoman Empire or any other port for domestic consumption. Within months, Levantine commodities arrived to London from Calais, Antwerp, Cartagena, Amsterdam and Odessa, in Bristol from Zante and in Liverpool from Corfu and Le Havre. The end of this great chartered company came about as part of wider moves to promote the more rational administration of the country's international trade and foreign affairs. In 1824, Canning informed the company that his ministry was assuming the authority over British diplomatic representations in the Levant. In 1825, a draft bill prepared by the Board of Trade concerning the Levant Company was presented to the General Court, which approved it unanimously. The bill delegated the company's authority and assets to the state. The company's governor, Lord Granville, had collaborated in the, in the preparation and gave it fervent support at the general court. George Liddell's final act as the company's representative was to hand to Joseph Planta, permanent secretary of the Foreign Office, a recommendation letter for Nathaniel Weary, who wished to continue his career in the Levant by assuming his father's office <coughs> in Smyrna. The letter was a final testimonial of the company's provinces, but it also reflected the will of its members, by that time introduced to the methods and techniques of the new corporate era, to build bridges with the succeeding establishment. Thank you.